Okay, go. All right, so uh, to start with, one of the things that, that comes up a lot um, in the continuum to do so is the pathway of blood through the heart. So we'll start there, um, just because it's something you don't need to know. So, low oxygen blood comes back to the body and into the vena cava. Drops down into that right atrium and then into the right ventricle. To do that, we're going to the tricuspid valve. To the right ventricle, blood is going to go up and out that pulmonary trunk. through the pulmonary semilunar valve. Out through pulmonary arteries. To the lungs. And pick up that oxygen. Then blood's going to drain back to the left atrium, down into the left ventricle. We're going to the bicuspid valve. Left ventricle up and out the aorta through the Aortic semilunar valve. And from the aorta out to the body, and we cycle again. Okay, so pathway blood with the valves. Big deal. Um, pulmonary circuit between the heart and the lungs, systemic circuit between the heart and the body, right side of the heart, low oxygen blood left side of the heart, um, high oxygen blood. Okay, so in this pathway of blood, we did talk about the fetal bypasses for um, pulmonary circulation. We talked about the ductus arteriosus, the ductus arteriosus becomes the ligamentum arteriosum in the adult and this is between the uh, pulmonary trunk and aorta and then we talked about the pyramidal valley which becomes the fossa ovalis in the adult and this is between the right and left atrium. Oh, thank you. So yes, to go back in the left atrium. All right, we're coming through. Those pulmonary veins here. Back in the left atrium. All right, so here, one thing to notice is, is the reversal between our, our veins and arteries there. So in pulmonary circulation, arteries look a lot more like veins, veins look more like arteries, and, and that oxygenation thing is reversed. But for the most part, you know, veins are carrying low oxygen blood and arteries high oxygen blood, except here at pulmonary circulation. So, I'm on the vein artery thing just a second. Um, Okay, so we've got these bypasses. The pathway of blood through the heart, it's one of these things that, that you're gonna to need to be able to apply in different ways. And so um, let's simplify a little bit here.
Great Ventral, Atrium, White Ventral, Red and Red. Turn right ventricle out to the lungs. So, and I'm just doing this to simplify this so that I'm not drawing arrows all the way across this other diagram. So, um, low oxygen on the right, high oxygen on the left. We talked about some congenital heart defects. So, one of the ones that we talked about is um, the ventricular septal defect. So a ventricular septal defect is when we have an opening between the ventricles. Now that's going to allow high and low oxygen blood to mix. Which way is the blood going to move? Left to right, right to left. Left to right. Why is it going to move left to right? Right. Because the left ventricle is pumping blood out to the body. So that left ventricular wall it, it is thicker more muscular, it's stronger because it's having to pump blood out to the body. So that's going to shove that blood over here to the right, where it kind of mixes, and we get that, that happening there. Now this is, don't think of this like a huge gaping hole, where right? it's leaking, and it's pushing that through to the right side. Because the left side is stronger than the right side, it's got more of a job to do. So in questions like that, to, to answer something like that, like you need to know what the ventricles are doing, like where the high and low oxygen blood is, the septum's a wall between the two, and you need to know the left side is stronger than the right side. So it, it really is just kind of putting these things together. I don't expect you ever to be able to like diagnose stuff. I'm not looking for you to remember the names of diseases by any chance. Um, in this sort of pathology application, you just have to know the pathway of blood through the heart. So that if we have an abnormal path, you can recognize it as such. Now, as long as we're here, we're talking about veins and arteries. Keep in mind that veins are usually high volume, low pressure. All veins return blood to the heart. Three phase will have valves and then the backflow of blood. This is not a lot of pressure. Blood moves with the pressure gradient. And in the veins, not so much of a gradient. So we don't have the same drive, the same push on the veins as we do on the arteries. So we put valves in them to keep blood from dropping back down. Veins are a blood reservoir, it's about 65% of your blood supply is in the veins. Arteries are high pressure, low volume. They're pressure reservoirs. Um, the arteries expand and, and recoil with that pressure and they bounce back and as they do, they continue to shove the blood further down. They, they maintain the pressure gradient that's necessary for circulation. So when we look at veins and arteries, you see a great deal of difference, like anatomically. The veins have a really big lumen. The walls are pretty thin compared to the arteries. The arteries, smaller lumen, really thick muscular wall and, and super elastic so that it expands and recoils.
as you go through this, again, make sure you spend time with that pathway of blood. You should definitely have that down. And that comes up um, a lot, even in like real life. The other thing that you should really be focused on are where we have these really big picture concepts, where multiple things kind of overlap into one big idea. And the biggest of these is like blood flow, blood pressure, um, events of the cardiac cycle, how all of that's tied together. So blood flow is the amount of blood that's going through any tissue in, any, like in a given period of time. Um, blood flow for the entire body is cardiac output, and then it's different through different tissues just depending. The blood flow, how much blood is going through any tissue, it is dependent on a couple of, couple of variables. One is the pressure gradient, right? The, the bigger the pressure gradient is, the more blood is going to flow. The more important variable though for blood flow is resistance. Resistance is the opposition to flow. And this one's the one that's more easily managed. When we need blood to go to a certain area, we decrease resistance. We, we decrease the opposition to the blood flow. This is vasodilation and vasoconstriction. So vasodilation, that blood vessel gets bigger. Vasoconstriction, it gets smaller. Vasodilation decreases resistance. And if we decrease resistance, we increase blood flow. Vasoconstriction increases resistance. If we increase resistance, we decrease blood flow. And this in the arteries is controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. Your major source of resistance is the uh, small diameter arteriole. It's here that we control blood flow directly into the tissues by constricting and, and dilating those small diameter arterioles. We're not like gonna constrict way back at the aorta, that's not great, that's the whole system. Or like even in the arm, we're not cutting off circulation in the arm, we're on a much smaller scale. So where's the arterioles before we go into the capillaries? Now our capillaries are the exchange vessels where nutrients and oxygen and, and fluid is exchanged. Things you should remember about capillaries. Capillaries, the wall is one cell thick. It's just endothelium. So the tissue that lines all the other blood vessels, that's all the capillaries is. Like it's just, capillaries are just that. They're really, really thin walled things. And you want that because we're moving stuff across either way. You should remember there are three types of capillaries. Continuous capillaries. Continuous capillaries are the most common, the least permeable. Finasterated capillaries. Finasterated means it has holes in it, so these are for filtration or absorption. So the kidneys, the small intestine. And then sinusoidal capillaries. These are the most permeable. You can only find them in places like the spleen or the liver. At the capillaries, we've got blood coming in on the arterial side and then blood going out on the venous side of the capillary. As we progress, the pressure changes. Going into the capillaries, because the capillary is just one cell thick, as we go into the capillaries, there's a big pressure drop. At the capillary. And this ensures that blood pressure doesn't make them explode. Because they're, you know, super fragile. 
with that pressure drop, we're also going to see a decrease in velocity. Meaning blood flow slows down as we get to the capillaries. Less pressure and it slows down. That's important so we don't remote apart and so that we give time for stuff to move. We, you don't want blood to just rush straight through. You need it to go out and, and kind of stall there for just a little bit, if nothing else, so that you move stuff across. Now, pressure is different on the vein and artery side, and we talked about the net filtration pressure here. The net filtration pressure is sort of the sum of all those pressures. We have two pressures. We have hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure is blood pressure. It pushes out. And we have osmotic pressure, which is um, pulling back in. So on the artery side, we're shoving stuff out. And on the vein side, we're kind of sucking it back in. Anything that's left over gets drained by the lymphatics. Don't expect you to calculate net filtration pressure. And we'll spend more time with net filtration pressure and talk about why it's important at the kidneys. Because it's super important at the kidneys. So now we've got resistance, the opposition, the flow. Blood flow from the whole system is cardiac output. And because there is resistance on the blood, because we're not just pumping blood into this open space, and you've got a, a closed circuit, right, that's in the blood vessels, and you're encountering resistance, um, you get pressure. So first, let's talk about our uh, factors for resistance. Factors that add to resistance. The first one is the total vessel length. The longer the blood vessel is, the more resistance you're going to encounter along the way. When you think about resistance, resistance is in essence friction. And the longer that blood vessel is, the more friction you're going to get as you go along. So, total vessel length. The next thing is viscosity. The thicker the blood is, the more friction you're going to encounter along the way. Those two things are relatively constant. When we need to change resistance to change blood flow, we do that through vasodilation and vasoconstriction. So our last factor here is um, the diameter of the vessel. And this is the one that we can easily change to increase or, or decrease resistance to the tissue. When we look at resistance, not just through like a single tissue, but in terms of the whole system, resistance is one of the factors that causes blood pressure. Blood moves with the pressure gradient high to low pressure, so we've got to have this to keep blood moving. And there are three big factors that create that pressure. So factors that contribute to pressure. Peripheral resistance. Cardiac output. Volume. All three of those things are directly proportional to blood pressure. The more resistance you get, the more pressure you get. The more cardiac output you get, the more pressure you get. The more volume you get, the more pressure you get. So let's start by looking at cardiac output. If you'll remember, cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. Stroke volume, that's uh, volume per beat. Heart rate, beat per minute. This is the cardiac output, volume per minute. How much blood is the heart pumping out in a minute? This is determined by the heart rate and by cardiac output. Things that affect the heart rate are called chronotropic factors. So chronotropic changes the heart rate. Positive chronotropic factors increase the heart rate. 
and negative chronotropic factor decreases the heart rate. Okay, so what are some positive chronotropic factors? Anything that acts like the sympathetic nervous system. Epinephrine, norepinephrine, crystal meth, whatever, if it acts like the sympathetic nervous system, it's going to increase your heart rate. If I increase the heart rate, I increase cardiac output. If I increase cardiac output, I increase blood pressure. Because cardiac output is one of these factors that goes into blood pressure. So this makes sense. If your heart beats faster, blood pressure is higher. If your heart beats slower, your blood pressure is lower. What would slow down your heart? The parasympathetic effect. So here, like epinephrine, norepinephrine, here, acetylcholine. The way that works is it binds to its receptor, and when it binds to its receptor, it opens the channel and lets potassium go in. So um, another factor here is extracellular potassium will slow down your heart. Something else that would speed up your heart that would act as a positive chronotropic factor is anything that blocks that parasympathetic response. So any blocker of those um, muscarinic cholinergic receptors would also speed up your heart rate. And quite often that's what we do. To bring someone's heart rate back from being really slow, you block that cholinergic receptor and your heart rate comes up because you block the parasympathetic effect. Parasympathetic slows it down, sympathetic speeds it up. You block the parasympathetic, by default it's going to speed up. And our other factor here is stroke volume. And we talked about three components of stroke volume. Preload, contractility, and afterload. Preload is based on something called the Frank Starling Law of the Heart. And what that tells us is that it rests cardiac muscles shorter than it should be, like it's for optimal length. So if you stretch it out, it's going to contract harder. Well, what's going to stretch the heart out? Putting more blood in it. So stroke volume is the end diastolic volume minus the end systolic volume. That's how much blood goes in minus how much blood is left. If we put more blood in, we're increasing the preload. So preload, we increase the preload, that's increasing the end diastolic volume. If you put more blood in, you get more blood out. So if we increase the preload, we increase the end diastolic volume, we increase cardiac output. That increases the stroke volume. If we increase cardiac output, we increase your blood pressure. What would make more blood come back to the heart? Like doing stuff, exercise. You exercise, more blood comes back to the heart. You increase venous return, the heart beats harder to get that blood out, and your blood pressure goes up. Your blood pressure goes up when you exercise. Like during the activity, your blood pressure is higher to circulate more blood out to the tissues. That's increasing the preload. Contractility is a similar idea. It's the force of the heartbeat, but now it's independent of the volumes. We don't care about how much blood goes in. It's just how hard your heart beats. And things that affect contractility are called inotropic factors. So a positive inotropic factor increases contractility. And a negative inotropic factor decreases contractility. Positive chronotropic factor. Anything that acts like the sympathetic nervous system. Or calcium influx. 
It's actually what the sympathetic branch is doing when that norepinephrine binds to its receptors, sets that second messenger system off, it ends up opening a calcium channel. Calcium comes in from the outside. Calcium binds to troponin, troponin moves to tropomyosin. You'll get more of those fibers moving now, those little filaments, and the heart beats harder. Things that decrease contractility, potassium is a big one. Or anything that blocks that calcium channel. If we increase contractility, the heart beats harder, it squeezes harder. That decreases the end systolic volume. It squeezes harder, now there's not as much blood left in it. That increases the cardiac output which would increase your blood pressure. The harder your heart beats, the more blood it pumps out, the higher your blood pressure is. The last thing is afterload. And afterload is the pressure that's pushing back on the heart. It's the pressure that's in the aorta and it's already there. Your heart has to overcome that pressure to get blood to go up and out. If we continue to increase the afterload, the heart can't get all the blood out. Increasing the afterload would increase the end systolic volume, which would then decrease cardiac output. This balances itself. If it, afterload is blood pressure, it's the pressure pushing back on the heart. And if you increase that, the heart can't pump out as much blood, which then brings that pressure back down. So that sort of regulates itself. There's some other things that will increase afterload. Um, in terms of like resistance and like atherosclerosis, but we're not going to concern ourselves with that at the moment. So all of those things, anything that affects stroke volume affects cardiac output. Anything that affects heart rate affects cardiac output. So all of these things can affect cardiac output, and if they can affect cardiac output, they can affect blood pressure. Resistance, we just talked about resistance, um, the opposition to flow. If we increase resistance, we increase pressure. That means that if we make your blood vessels constrict, like across the board, your blood pressure is going to be higher. If you make them dilate, your blood pressure is lower. The last thing is volume. Big picture, long term control of blood pressure is the job of the kidneys. And they do this by adjusting volume. And this can happen in two ways. As your blood pressure goes up, you're shoving more blood through the kidneys. They're filtering it out and they're making urine. The higher your blood pressure is, the more fluid you're shoving through the kidneys. The kidneys then will lose that fluid as urine, pressure comes back down. If we reduce the amount of blood flow to the kidneys, there we the pressure going through the kidneys. The kidneys don't feel like they can do their job because of the lack of blood supply. Well, they release something called renin. We have our renin angiotensin mechanism. So floating around in your plasma is that inactive plasma protein, angiotensinogen. As always, you can see that inactive protein on that suffix. It's in the plasma, it's just floating around, it's cool. It's not doing anything right now. When the kidneys release renin, renin turns angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is then converted into angiotensin 2. By that angiotensin converting enzyme. Angiotensin 2 is a rather potent vasoconstrictor. Blood vessels constrict. Your blood vessels constrict. That's increasing resistance. Angiotensin II also causes the release of aldosterone. Aldosterone, if you'll remember from endocrine stuff, causes sodium retention, potassium excretion. You retain sodium, you also retain water. So the effect of that is to increase the volume. 
So angiotensin II increases resistance and it increases volume. And both of those things increase your blood pressure. And now your kidneys are happy again and they can do their job. So now, all of these things factor into this idea of blood pressure. And blood pressure is extremely medically significant to us, managing blood pressure. The most common primary diagnosis in the United States is hypertension. We go to great ends to manage this. And we can do this by using these principles and modifying them. So one thing we can use is a diuretic. Diuretic increases the volume of urine that you're making, so you have to pee more. That is decreasing volume. And if you decrease volume, you decrease pressure. We'll talk about diuretics once we get to the kidneys and the mechanism there. Okay. That one was easy. We can also change cardiac output. Our factors that go on the cardiac output. Stroke volume, heart rate. Okay, um, we can we can change both of those things at the same time. So, stroke volume. We have preload, contractility, and afterload. We got a sympathetic effect right there for contractility. Epinephrine makes your heart beat harder. Epinephrine also makes your heart beat faster. So if we block the action of epinephrine, norepinephrine, we can slow down your heart, and we can decrease how hard it's beating. Doing this, we would use something called a beta blocker. A beta blocker blocks that beta-1 receptor at the heart. And the result of that is that we decrease the heart rate, we decrease contractility, and those decrease cardiac output. And if we decrease cardiac output, we decrease your blood pressure. We can make your heart beat with less force. We can use a, a, a negative inotrope to do this. We could use a calcium channel blocker. A calcium channel blocker is just straight up a negative inotropic agent. It blocks that calcium influx, so now calcium doesn't get to come in from the outside and bind to troponin and make all of this happen, and that's going to decrease contractility, which then decreases cardiac output and decreases blood pressure. Angiotensin II is a pretty potent hormone with multiple mechanisms. So something else we can do is we can stop that action. We can use an ACE inhibitor. An ACE inhibitor blocks this enzyme, that angiotensin converting enzyme. Then angiotensin II is not made. If angiotensin II is not being made, this is going to decrease resistance, and it prevents the release of aldosterone, so we're not releasing so much aldosterone, and that's going to decrease how much water you retain, so we're decreasing the volume. Decrease resistance, we decrease volume, we decrease pressure. Similar medication, an ARB, which is an angiotensin receptor blocker, same idea. Only here, rather than blocking the formation of angiotensin II, we just block the receptors for it. So these things are altering these factors that go into blood pressure by altering cardiac output, volume, or resistance. Notice that potassium is both a negative chronotropic agent and a negative 
anotropic agent. It slows down your heart and it makes your heart beat with less force. In excess, it will stop your heart. One thing that we talked about when we talked about endocrine stuff is Addison's disease. And in Addison's disease, we have a chronic adrenal insufficiency. Basically, decreased levels of aldosterone. So if you're not secreting that aldosterone, aldosterone causes sodium retention and potassium excretion. So if we decrease the levels of aldosterone, that causes increased amounts of potassium in the blood. That increased amount of potassium in the blood is going to have effects. It's also going to cause decreased amounts of sodium in the blood, so decreased amounts of water. That's going to reduce the volume. You're losing pressure there. Potassium is both a negative inotropic and a negative chronotropic agent, so you reduce cardiac output. So what happens in patients with Addison's disease is that aldosterone level is so low that potassium starts to accumulate and the heart might stop or the pressure that it's creating is so low that we can't keep circulation going. Because all the things in this disease cause your blood pressure to be ridiculously low. And we've got to have that pressure to continue circulation because blood moves with that pressure gradient. Okay. Another thing that we spent a lot of time with is the idea of um, the conduction system of the heart, this intrinsic conduction system. So if we start at the beginning, Final atrial node, so it's your SA node. The impulse goes down to the atrioventricular node. It goes through internodal fibers. From the atrioventricular node, it's going to go out that atrioventricular bundle which branches into two bundle branches. Goes all the way down to the apex where it comes back up as Purkinje fibers. Think sit down here. Up here at the SA node, this is the fastest of the bunch. This is the pacemaker, this is where things start. The atrioventricular bundle and those bundle branches are in the fibrous skeleton of the heart. Which means they're not in contact with the heart muscle. They're surrounded by electrical insulation. So that electrical impulse travels all the way down to the apex and then it comes into contact with the Purkinje fibers and comes back up. The result of that is that ventricular depolarization begins at the apex. The ventricles contract from the bottom up because that's where you want blood to go. You want the ventricles to contract and squeeze blood up and out. The atria contract from the top down because you want the atria to shove the blood down into the ventricles. So atrial contraction begins at the base and then goes down, and ventricular contraction begins at the apex and then goes up. We do have a delay here at the AV node. Smaller diameter fibers. Fewer gap junctions. And that delay allows time for blood to move. So the heartbeat is two events and not just squishing it, right? Blood goes down the ventricles, then gets pumped out.
you need to be able to recognize the part of an EKG. That includes both uh, um, the parts of a normal or a sinus rhythm, and then being able to recognize uh, what's missing or what's wrong in some sort of abnormality. I don't expect you to like look at somebody's EKG and diagnose their second degree heart block, but you should realize there's something wrong with that EKG and you should be able to identify the parts of the EKG and sort of what's dysfunctional there. So first let's look at normal. There's a little flat line right here. That's your delay at the AV node. Then we have our QRS complex. This is a ventricular depolarization. And then finally you have your T wave. which is ventricular repolarization. So we talked about some different types of arrhythmias. A fibrillation is when we get uncontrolled impulses of the cardiac muscle. Uh, the, that conduction system no longer firing as a unit. That's the way you see two types of fibrillation. And atrial fibrillation, the atria are fibrillating. Atrial depolarization is the P wave. So what you'll see in atrial fibrillation is a, a weird P wave. And you get your QRS and your T and then your weird P wave. QRS, T, Weird. So, atrial fibrillation, it's that P wave that's messed up and just sort of waiting. This is different than ventricular fibrillation. There's no baseline here for V-fib, it's just a wave to speak of, everything's sort of absent, the heart's just fluttering, the whole thing is just kind of fluttering. So we have some other EKGs. So let's see. There's our QRS complexes. There's our T wave. What's missing from this EKG is a P wave. There's no P wave. In the absence of the sinoatria node, if this doesn't work, the atrioventricular node takes over as the new pacemaker for the heart. It's slower than the SA node. So while the SA node depolarizes like 75 times a minute, here you're looking at like maybe 60, 50. Maybe slower, just depending. So it's slower. And there's no P wave, so the atria aren't depolarizing, so the atria aren't contracting. We're just relying on gravity to drop that 80% of blood down from the atria to the ventricles. This is a, and like I said, you don't need to memorize what they're called, but this is a junctional rhythm. If this shows up, 
you'll see that and, and like it'll be there it's like this is a junctional rhythm what i'm looking for is that you can recognize what's missing and what that translates into for the heart so here we're missing that p wave the translation there is the atria aren't contracting they're not depolarized So we got our QRS again. Um, there's the T wave. So that's a P wave, and that's P wave, that's P wave, that's P wave, and T wave, and T wave. Your ratio here should be one to one. Like for every P wave, you get a QRS. Now we don't. Like it's like roughly two to one. You got way too many P waves. The translation for that is that not all those impulses are getting through. That SA node is firing, there's your P wave, and then it goes down to the AV node, then nothing happens after that. So it's turned over, and now it fires again, and maybe the next time it does happen. Anytime you've got too many P waves like this, this is a heart block. And, and technically this is a second degree heart block, again, I don't care that you can recognize that. If we were looking at a third degree heart block, you'd just see P waves. And none of the impulses get through. No QRS complexes. A first degree heart block, they still get through, but it's really slow. So we're not worried there. Again, don't worry about diagnosing this or identifying it, just realize what's missing. If somebody has a third degree heart block, and we're stopping that impulse here, what happens to that person? So what happens? They freaking die. Their heart's not beating. Like if the heart's not pumping blood out of the body, the heart's not beating. So you're screwed unless we get that QRS back. And that's a third degree heart block. It just stops. Like the atria depolarizing, that's not helpful. If the ventricles don't depolarize and the ventricles don't contract, we don't get blood out to the body. Second degree heart block, we're not getting as much blood out to the body. Right? So in a second degree heart block, your heart's skipping a beat. It's going to greatly decrease cardiac output and blood pressure. And they'll probably pass out a lot. be able to recognize the different parts of the EKG and then understand what those what that means in terms of the heart itself. Which one is the, the one on the left is the one on the The multicolor? No, um, where it only has the T wave and the QRS. My left or your left? Keep saying that there were only the P wave and the QRS. Okay, that's a junction over here. Okay. This intrinsic conduction system is what makes the heart autorhythmic because those, uh, those cells spontaneously depolarize. And when they do, the ones that are in contact with the, the myocardium are connected by gap junctions, and it travels through as a wave. Cardiac muscle cells are, are really interconnected. You should know that cardiac muscle fibers are connected at intercalated discs. An intercalated disc has a gap junction, which is the electrical connection between the cells, and the desmosome like a physical connection, like a spot weld that holds those cells together so they don't rip apart when the heart contracts. Because we're connected electrically and 
physically at the heart. We say the heart behaves as a functional syncytium. That means that functionally, the heart acts like one big cell. Because of all these connections. Now, I'm not worried about like uh, unstable resting potentials or right the, the threshold there and sodium coming back in. Um, we did spend some time with cardiac action potential, though, um, in terms of the myocardium, just because it's different than it is for skeletal muscle. So you do need to know that um, the action potential uh, in the cardiac muscle fiber has a really long refractory period. It has a, a plateau in the action potential. And this is caused by calcium influx. So instead of just straight up and straight down, that cardiac action potential flattens out at the top and then sort of slopes off. The reason that this is important is because it prevents temporal summation. It prevents the heart muscle from contracting and sustaining that contraction or building up tension and sustaining that contraction. In skeletal muscle, the difference between you closing your hand like clenching your fist really hard is in how fast those impulses are being fired. And so we build on the contraction. And the faster that action potential arrives at the muscle, the more tension you build up in the muscle. That's not good for the heart. We don't need the heart to just keep increasing in tension. We want the heart to contract and relax and contract and relax. And that really long refractory period there prevents it from just building on those contractions. So that's that plateau in the cardiac action potential. I'm not worried about sliding filament theory. We've already done this. So while um, calcium moves in, it binds to troponin, troponin moves to tropomyosin, myosin binds to actin, and all that sliding filament thing is still in play here. I'm not going to ask you about myosin and actin filaments or troponin and tropomyosin or the cross group cycle. Um, it's exactly the same as it would be in skeletal muscle, myosin and actin also. As blood comes into the heart, a lot of ventricular filling is just passive. So blood goes straight from the atria down to the ventricles. So as blood's returned to the heart, those atrial ventricular valves, the bicuspid and tricuspid, are open. So blood just drops down in the ventricles. And then it starts to accumulate in the ventricles. As pressure in the ventricles increases, it's going to push it back up on those atrial ventricular valves. So you need to know that pressure in the ventricles closes the two atrioventricular valves. That's the bicuspid and the tricuspid valve. And as those valves close, the ventricles keep contracting. And once they keep contracting, the pressure keeps going up. And the same pressure in the ventricles opens the two semilunar valves. Those atrioventricular valves are closed and they stay closed as the pressure increases because they're anchored by those chordae tendinae. These prevent prolapse of the valve. So the valve can't open the opposite direction. It's held down by those chordae tendinae. So as pressure in the ventricles builds up, it can push on that valve while it wants to. It can't go the other way. And then it has to go up and out those two semilunar valves to the body or to the lungs.
terms that we discuss. That you should be familiar with. An aneurysm is a localized dilation of a vessel wall. thrombosis, blood clot. An embolus means detached intravascular mass. loose and then it's a thromboembolism and it's floating around and it might land somewhere else and it blocks circulation to something. Um, atherosclerosis is this hardening of the arterial wall. to the cholesterol filled plaque. The result of that is to increase resistance in that vessel. So you have your blood vessel and now you have this plaque in, in it like this. That is increasing resistance. That's pinching that blood flow off there in the middle. If we increase resistance, we decrease blood flow. That's the definition of resistance. Opposition of flow. So if we increase resistance, we decrease flow. If we're going up blood flow to, say, your heart, that's a bad thing. So atherosclerosis is particularly problematic because we talk about coronary artery disease. As those arteries get hard and they're blocked off by these cholesterol-filled plaques. And we deprive the heart muscle of oxygen. Cardiac muscle is not like skeletal muscle. Cardiac muscle requires oxygen continually. It can only use aerobic respiration. So any interruption in that oxygen supply is going to be extremely dangerous for that muscle cell. talked a little bit about heart failure, right? The gradual weakening of the heart muscle so that it can't meet the needs of the tissues. And the difference between right and left heart failure. This, again, I don't, I'm not gonna tell you, I'm like, you have a patient that comes in and you, like, difficulty breathing, you hear fluid around the lungs. Uh, what's going on? I'm not gonna ask you this. But you should know the pathway of blood through the heart. Blood from the body comes back to the right atrium and then the right ventricle and so on. Heart failure means the heart is getting weaker. It's not pumping all the blood out. There's a lot more blood that's left behind in the heart. And if that real estate's already occupied by blood, you can't put more blood there. There's already some blood there. So what happens to that blood? Well, now it's stuck. It's got to wait in line before it can get in. That's increasing the volume in the veins, and it's going to go all the way back to the capillaries. It's going to increase the volume and the pressure there, and it's going to push more fluid out at the capillaries. So in right heart failure, fluid is leaving at the capillaries, this is their capillaries, we have peripheral edema. 
The right heart is getting blood from the body, so that's where the backlog of fluid is. It's out in the body. So that's where the fluid builds up. And we're looking at left heart failure. Well, the left heart gets blood from the lungs. So now, the same thing, blood's coming in from the lung, but there's already blood in the heart, so it's gotta wait before it can get in. So in left heart failure, we see pulmonary edema. That fluid accumulates around the lungs because it can't get back to the heart because the heart's busy right now. It can't keep up with what it has. But like I said, this is just based on your knowledge of that pathway of blood through the heart. We got our coronary vessels, the ones that go to the heart itself. Um, anything there, like you should know the, the left coronary artery drains, or sorry, supplies like 75% of the heart. And all those others are just down from there. So when tissues are active, they release something that causes vasodilation. We don't manage blood flow by doing systemic pressure changes. So like as you're writing stuff right now, to get more blood to go to your hands and feel those muscles, we don't increase the blood pressure. We decrease resistance. We allow more blood to move there. Those blood vessels that go to those muscles dilate because active tissues create a byproduct, like their metabolism creates uh, something that makes blood vessels dilate. So you get more blood flow to compensate them for the fact that they're burning through oxygen right now. And that's true for most tissues. Blood flow to the brain is rather constant. It doesn't change a whole lot. Um, blood flow through the muscles goes up by a lot because the muscles will burn through so many resources. Blood flow through the skin is different because it's temperature regulated. When your body temperature goes up, blood flow to the skin goes up so that you can lose that body heat. Um, you should know that diastole is relaxation and systole is contraction. So we have diastolic and systolic blood pressure. Diastolic pressure is the pressure when your heart's relaxed, systolic when it's contracting. They're going to have to calculate mean arterial pressure. Oh. You should know that an anastomosis is a collateral channel, an alternate route through circulation. So blood can take another path. There's more than one way to get back. There's more than one way out. 
when tissues require continually require more oxygen, um, eventually new blood vessels form and begin an excuse me, anastomosis. And these are common in for arteries are common in like the joints and the heart, the brain. For veins, they're common everywhere. Well, there's more than one way to get back um, to the heart. We looked at edema, that uh, ascites was the abdominal edema where all that fluids build up around the abdomen. And you saw those those veins on the surface, those superficial veins, kaput medusae, where it looks like snakes going across them. The reason those are so filled with blood is because there's no other way for blood to get back to the heart. It's having to travel in those superficial veins out and around the liver. Um, in that case, because the liver is so hard, it can't get through. We'll look at that later when we look at the liver. Um, but those are anastomoses. It's a collateral channel. There's always another way back. Um, valves of the veins. With this, we've been over everything that's on there. Um, some of it in great deals of detail and more specific than you would expect. Some of it, it's just going to involve you putting those pieces together and being able to say, okay, if you're increasing the heart rate, what's that gonna do to blood pressure? Some of that's pretty obvious if you just step, take a step back and think about it. If your heart beats faster, your blood pressure's higher. So why? Well, because it's increasing stroke, well, it's increasing cardiac output, heart. The heart beats faster, you increase cardiac output. If you increase cardiac output, you increase blood pressure. So some of it is just putting those pieces together and going through. And then some of it will be applying it um, in terms of like treating hypertension and this sort of thing. Um, but we have been over everything that's there. So if, um, in the next couple of days, if there's, there's something that, that you don't get or that we skip, um, drop me an email or send me a text and we'll go over it. Um, otherwise, that's it for now. And I will see you on Wednesday for this exam. Please stop that one for me.